preacher recently related a story of being in a store and seeing a young boy with his mother as they were shopping and the little boy had picked up something off the shelf and 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 put it put it in the cart and the mother looked at him and said well son that's not that's not on my list of things to buy and he says well I want to get this for me for Christmas and Sometimes we think about things, of course, that we would like to have and things we would give to ourselves. It's always uh, thought-provoking and to, to try and come up with things to, to give to others. But I think about us as Christians, and I thought about the story and thought, well, what would I give to myself spiritually if I were to give myself gifts? What would I want to give to myself to make myself a better Christian. And I thought of four things that I would give that I think would help me and I know would help me to be more like my Lord, be a better Christian, and be a greater encouragement to others. I would give to myself a greater faith in God's providence. I would give myself greater hope in God's promises. I would give to myself a greater love For my fellow man, I would give to myself a greater love for my God himself. Thinking about the first one, we live from day to day and we think about the things that that we need, the things in our lives that, that make things go and keep our food on the table and keep the bills paid and take care of the medical expenses and we think about our needs When Paul wrote to the Christians in Philippi, he told them in chapter 4 and verse 19 that my God will supply your every need. And of course that was in Christ Jesus. Did you realize that when Paul wrote that, he was speaking of a church that, that existed in the area of Macedonia. And when you read 2 Corinthians chapter 8, you'll find that the churches of Macedonia from their deep poverty gave to the needs of the collection that Paul was taking up for the four saints in Jerusalem. Therefore, we would classify the church at Philippi as being a needy church itself. If we looked at it, a a congregation that we would probably consider to be in poverty, to be very poor. One of the things I appreciate about that church was the fact that they helped Paul as he went about his missionary work. They gave to him regularly, and he recorded that in his letter to that particular church. But I was looking at that and thinking about it. Paul said that God would supply your every need. And I think of the things that we identify as wants, And then we think of those things that we need. And I would say we would create two different lists for that. When you go, if you are one of those people who makes a family budget, naturally, perhaps, one of the first things you might put down is how much money you make. And then you go down the list of that budget and say, well, I have to pay rent or a house payment, and I have to pay for electricity, and I have to pay for water, and, and I have to pay for... Uh, and then you start thinking, well, no, this is not, cable TV is not really a need, so I'll put that on the want list, but you might have it in the needs list. But then you think, well, you've got to buy groceries. I believe the first thing I should put down in my budget is after I look at my income is what I'm going to give to God. Now, that's not a need, that's, that's just a desire to do that particular thing, is it not? But we would have our needs list and we'd have our want list. And I think about that poor church in Philippi and how that God promised them through Paul to supply all of their needs. And he says, of course, it is in Christ. And I think sometimes as I look at that and I look at myself, Roger, When you look at God to help you, to help take care of you, are you looking more at what you really want Him to do for you that you really don't have to have? Are you really looking at those things that you would ask God to do that would be your needs? 
our society has has a strong pull on us and ha- makes it difficult to differentiate between needs and wants, doesn't it? They make it very difficult because you need this in order to keep up with that or to be able to accomplish this. And yet we have to realize that, I think about Job, but you go and look at Job, that many believe that was one of the first books that was ever written, one of the earliest records of man and his relationship with God as far as uh, writing of material goes. And Job was a wealthy man. I mean, if you look at those things in Job chapter 3, his possessions were 7,000 sheep. His possessions were 3,000 camels. 500 yoke of oxen, that's a 1,000 oxen, that's 500 yoke, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, I'd say so, because somebody has to take care of all those animals. He would have all these people there working for him, and you would say, Job was a wealthy man, he was a businessman, he was able to accomplish great things, and, and yet, and it says that he was the greatest of all the people of the East at the end of verse 4. But you know, God allowed Satan to come and attack the house of Job and kill his children. Satan hit Job hard. Would we say he hit him between the eyes and he hit him in the heart when he took these things away and without taking the time to go through all the things that he took, I look at Job's attitude. Here was a man with all of these possessions. And yet he says in verse 21, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. And the Lord, the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So Job considered those things a blessing, but he didn't consider them things that he had to have. He considered them a benefit and a blessing to his life. And even when all these things were taken away, in verse 22, the scripture says, In all this Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. If I could give a gift to myself, I would give to myself a greater appreciation for what God has given me, for the things that he has made available to me. And there Job sits with virtually nothing left. And, and, and it's all been, of course that's not all, but still. Then he stricken with sickness. What was his wife, dis, wife's disposition? You ought to curse God and die. So he had enemies from all sides. But even so, Job still maintained his faith in God. He appreciated the providence of his God. Consider David's words in Psalm 37 and verse 25. David said, I've been young and now I'm old. And yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread. Again, Psalm 37 and verse 25. The righteous seem to be satisfied with those things that God has given. And I think about this time of year and how the people, the merchants and all the people who are buying and selling, they want you to buy their products. And I understand the need to turn a dollar. They're in business to make money. But I often think how many times, I I like the fact that sometimes I can walk through the mall and say there's really nothing in here that I want. And I think that helps me bring myself into some perspective because Jesus When he left this world, all he had were the clothes on his back and the Roman soldiers gambled over those. I want a greater appreciation for the providence of God. I want to have a greater hope in God's promises. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23, the writer says of God, He is faithful who promised. God is is faithful in His promises. I know sometimes you and I, we may promise to do this, and we may promise to do that, and I believe that our intentions are good. We want to do that, and we intend to do it, 
But at times, because of circumstance, we don't do it. Maybe something calls our attention, or maybe we get sick, or maybe we're just not able. But God never has made a promise that He was unable to keep. God promises. You and I are the beneficiaries of God's promises. When He makes those promises to us. God is faithful. God is true in everything that He says and that He does. You and I can count on God to be absolutely trustworthy. In a day and time where we don't trust many people. We don't trust many institutions. We don't trust a lot of things. Almighty God, our Creator... Our provider is trustworthy. If God would provide the things that the church in Philippi needed, and Jesus would make it clear in Matthew 6, 33, if we seek His kingdom and His righteousness first, we'll have the things that we need. We're talking about physical things. God knows as, as we go from day to day that we have to have our food, that we need clothing, that we need shelter. Jesus discussed that in the context of Matthew chapter 6. But more important than that, I want to have a greater faith or a greater hope in the promises of God as far as spiritual matters go. We're not going to be on this earth for very long when you think about it. And when we leave this whole world, there are but two places we're going. We're either going to heaven or we're going to hell. Only one of two choices. Only one of two places. And God from the beginning of time has made promise after promise after promise after promise of things that he has said that he will do. Has he ever failed? Has he ever relinquished on anything that he promised that he would do? Has he ever lied? Of course he has not and would not. When I think about the song, Standing on the Promises of Christ, you know the song, now we're talking about believing it. When we stand on it, we believe it. Standing on those promises of Christ our King. Through eternal ages let His praises ring. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 through 15. Hebrews 6, verses 9 through 15. Now we're talking about a man everybody knows about. We're talking about Abraham, God's great servant. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 through 15. Beloved, we are more confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation Though we speak in this manner, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, that you have ministered to the saints and do minister, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope to the end, that you be, do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises for... When God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself saying, Surely, blessing I'll bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Now we're talking about God's promise to Abraham. Paul helps us with this and makes it a little more clear in Romans 4 verses 19 and following. Using a similar, uh, dis it's very similar discussion, but with more detail. And not being weak in faith. And we're talking about Abraham. Not being weak in faith. Again, this is Romans 4, 19 and following. He did not consider his own body all ready dead since he was about a hundred years old. And the deadness of Sarah's womb. But he did not waver at the promise of God. Through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Here's a man who's a hundred years of age. God has promised a son to a hundred-year-old man. God has promised a son to a woman whose scripture says that more or less that Sarah's womb was dead. In other words, she was not able to, to, be, to, be, to become pregnant, to be able to have a child. And here's a man who's 100 years old who, normally speaking, he's not able to bring children into the world. But God said he'd give it to him. He said, I'll give you that son. 
He promised. And what I appreciate so much about Abraham, you know it's one thing to say I believe it, but Paul said that he didn't even waver at the promise. Now, brethren, that's faith. And that's an expectation. Expectation, genuine expectation is Bible hope. Hope is not something that's a maybe or maybe not in Scripture. Bible hope is expectation that it's going to happen. He didn't even waver at the promise, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, being fully convinced of what He had promised. He was also able to perform. There are a couple of things that we should see with that particular reference. Number one, look how old Abraham is. Number two, look at his wife, unable to bear children. I'm going to give you a son. Most of us would say, we might even do what Sarah did, we might laugh. But Abraham didn't. He didn't even waver at the promise. And he believed not only that, but God was able to do what he said he could do. Sometimes we think, well, how is God going to do that? If he says he's going to do it, why do we worry about the how? Why do we worry about how God's going to do this or going to do that? If he says, I'll provide your needs, then you be faithful and he will. If you believe in the promises of God with regard to our salvation, look at with me in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. We understand this chapter is what we have, the list there, what we call the Christian graces. I'd like to back up with, to verse 2, if you would, in 2 Peter chapter 1. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now watch this. Abraham believed God was able. Peter says, His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Promises that through these you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I have often wondered if the divine nature was not a part of what happens to us on earth as we live for the Lord. And I believe that that is in part true. But as Peter helps us, as he goes through this list, he's not simply looking at now. He's looking at the future. That one day, when this life is over, you, if you're faithful and I'm faithful, will take on divine nature. God promised that. What does that mean? I don't know. I've never been that way before. But I believe it's going to happen. And Peter gives us the pattern by which that becomes a reality with all those things he lists. Also, for this very reason, add your faith virtue. And the virtue of knowledge, and the knowledge self-control, and the self-control perseverance, and the perseverance brotherly kindness, and the brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you'll never stumble. Watch him. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Divine nature. An entrance into the kingdom. Now let's just bring it down to a reality. We may believe God promised this to Abraham, and that was good for Abraham, and Abram, Abram did not waver at the promise. And he believed God was able to do what he would perform. Do you believe that God can help you in such a way and you can live in such a way when you die you're going to heaven? Do you live with that kind of confidence? I need to give myself that kind of confidence, brethren. That if I'm faithful and I die, I have absolutely nothing to worry about. I need to give that to myself. We're not talking about half-hearted Christianity. We're not talking about kind of do this Christian Christianity thing, but we're talking about dedicated service, and that's what Peter spells out for us. Here is Abraham. 
100 years old, Sarah about 90. The promises of God do not depend necessarily. His promises don't depend on our abilities. Peter tells us how to get to heaven, but the promise is there nonetheless. You understand that? You're not earning your way to heaven. You're living in such a way that heaven's going to be the home for people who love God and want to live in a body, in an existence that takes on divine nature. How can you live in, in a nature that's not divine and expect to have divine nature in eternity? Peter says, no, no, no. You add to your faith virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, brotherly kindness, <coughs> love, and all those things and then, the, then naturally heaven will indeed be your home. But really and truly, let me ask you, what did you do to bring about the cross? Not a thing. Not really. God did that just as surely as Abraham did nothing for God to bring about that promise to bring that boy to him and his wife. He believed it. God was going to do it. Abraham believed it. And it became a reality. The third thing I would give myself is greater love for my fellow man. It's hard to love some people. Sometimes I may be one of those people it's hard to love. It's hard to love folks sometimes, isn't it? And I look at God and I look at Jesus and I look at, at His ultimate goal. I am fully convinced that Jesus didn't like the Jews. I mean, why would he like them? But he loved them. He loved them without question. I figured sometimes that, I don't think there was a point where Paul didn't like John Mark. But I believe he loved him. I want to have a greater love for my fellow man and that's outside my brotherhood. You know, it's easier to love the church sometimes than it is to love people outside. Well, I understand part of that. We've got this common connection, haven't we? We, we, we may have our disagreements, and, but we still love each other. At least I hope we do. But there's a lot of people out there, they don't even know what I'm talking about. They don't have a clue. They don't have a clue who we are and what we have. And if I can love them and help them, they can come to an understanding those Christians really have something. Those people, they really have something that I don't have. And I want some of that. And I look at it, I look at Jesus in Matthew chapter 22. Jesus being the perfect servant of God, the servant who gave himself in all ways, beginning with verse 34. The Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, so they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, saying, Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. There are two, two basic things that will help us, to help me, to give the gift to myself to love all people. Number one, I have to love God with my whole being. If I'm going to love God with my whole being, I need to understand Him. But then I love my neighbor as myself. This little boy that was putting the gift in the mother's shopping cart, we can understand a little boy doing that. But we can understand giving to ourselves, can't we? I mean, let's face it. Let's just be honest. I will buy something for myself before I buy it for you. Now, let's just be honest about it. We just do that, don't we? And I have to stop and think about that. If my wife needs this, if my son needs this, if my brother needs this, why should I not buy for him or her as well? Why should I only give to what makes me happy? Only to what satisfies my longings, my desires, to give and love my neighbor as myself? Now that's what gift I want to give to myself. 
Because by nature we're self-centered, aren't we? We are. We are self-focused. Is God self-focused? Other than He's worthy of worship. Other than that, God is a giver. He's been a giver since the dawn of time. And He will be giving until Jesus comes again. And then when He comes again, He's going to give us everything He's got. Think about it. So you love your neighbor as yourself. This is based on Deuteronomy 6, 5. Leviticus 19, 18. Today, at a time when mankind seems to have lost hope in itself, that's what's wrong with our world. We don't, the world doesn't trust each other. They have no confidence in each other. And sometimes they have no reason to. They need people like you and like me who would do like Jesus and sit down and eat with the outcasts of society. They're where they are because of sin. We understand that. In Luke chapter 7, beginning with verse 18. The disciples of John reported to him concerning all the things that Jesus had done. John's in prison. He's been put in prison. And so John calls two of his disciples to him in verse 19. And he sent them to Jesus saying, Are you the coming one or do we look for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, Are you the coming one or do we look for another? And that very hour he cured many of infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and many blind he gave sight. Jesus answered and said to them, You go and tell John the things you've seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Jesus cared about the downtrodden of society. He did. I know that the things that Jesus did, according to John 20, verses 30 and 31, were signs to point to Him as the Christ. But don't tell me Jesus did that with a cold heart. He didn't. Yes, they were signs to point that He was to Him as the Christ, but also to point to Him as a compassionate Lord who cared about people in their infirmities and ultimately, the bottom line was the poor have the gospel preached to them. Sometimes we look at society and we want to talk to people who are like us. Let me tell you something. From God's perspective, we're all like us. With souls. Eternal souls. If I could give to myself a greater gift, it would be a greater concern for all mankind. Finally, I'd give to myself a greater love for God Himself. When I look in Exodus chapter 3, God's people are in bondage in Egypt. God is concerned about that situation. He had His plan in place. He, uh, he had it in His mind <clears throat> to use a man named Moses to go and deliver, to go and deliver His people. In Moses, verse 1, was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I'll now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. I read that for this purpose. Number one, that's the first time the word holy is used in scripture. And it's used with reference to God. Coming into God's presence, though it be through a burning bush, that's a holy place. It's a holy moment. When we assemble in this building, there's nothing holy about this building except what we're doing. As we assemble here and pray, we're on holy ground. 
When we assemble here and sing, we're on holy ground. When we assemble here and take the Lord's Supper, we're on holy ground. When we're preaching the gospel through God's word, we're on holy ground. I want to remember why. Because God is here. Because God is here. We could meet outside if need be. We'd be on holy ground. We could go to a state park and meet. We'd be on holy ground. It's what we're doing. But God's presence. God's presence. I want a greater respect for God's presence in my life. He's my father. Jesus is my brother. And however you understand the indwelling of the Holy Spirit... The Word of God says the Spirit dwells within us. I want a greater respect and reverence for that. I don't want to take it for granted. I, have, I believe I have good relationships with a lot of people. Not perfect. None of us has perfect relationships with anyone on this earth. But I want a perfect one with God. I want it to be as flawless as possible. And I think about God's characteristics. Why do I bring this up? Moreover, he said in verse 6, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. In other words, I'm the same God of all these people. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. But God had a purpose for him. He says, I've surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard the, their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come up to me and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. So from that moment on, he talks to Moses about how to go and deliver God's people. I want to look at this. God's concern for those people. He heard their cry. It's important for me, it's important for you to understand the relationship we have with God, how precious worship is, but that also God hears your cries. He's concerned about you. Don't forget Him. Don't let Him slip from your mind when the tough times come or when the easy times are here, but at all times. And then we finally look at what God ultimately did and His great love for us. In Acts 3 and verse 22, the record says, For Moses surely said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things whatever he says to you. We understand that to be a fulfillment and be fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And then we turn to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to, Lord willing, have a lesson tonight on what, what uh, Christmas really means, what it really is. But we don't know when Jesus was born. The Scripture nowhere tells us to have a special day to celebrate the birth of our Lord, but it certainly does recognize it as a valuable event in history. We noted in our class this morning, Isaiah seven fourteen, the virgin will be with child. And, and it's fulfilled in Jesus. In Matthew one twenty one. She will bring forth a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done. That it might be fulfilled. Which was spoken by the Lord. Through the prophet saying. Behold the virgin shall be with child. And bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel. Which translated is. God with us. When I think about developing a greater appreciation for God, I move myself back to that time with Moses and, and think of the respect and reverence Moses must have developed for God over time and the experiences that he had. And yet people in the first century saw Jesus. They heard him speak. If there had been an artist then who so desired, he could have drawn a picture and we would know what it looked like. But God in his wisdom didn't allow that. But that's not really it anyway. God with 
us. That gift of salvation is the most precious promise God has ever made. And it's the one you should carry in your heart to create and develop and establish and confirm and live with a greater respect for what God did and all that He's done. Not only is He holy, not only is He a provider for my material things, He's a great provider for the spiritual. Therefore, He first loved us, 1 John 4 and verse 19. He first loved us so that we would know how to love Him. These are the things that I would give to myself, a greater faith in the providence of God. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night, shall not cease. That's a physical promise. As long as this earth remains, everything will be here that I need to to live and to be sustained. But then the great love is the gift of Christ. Jesus sat down with the woman of Samaria so that she would know who God in the flesh was. Jesus went home with Zacchaeus so that he would know who God in the flesh was. And the greater love for the person of God must be not only something that I have in my heart, but I live for Him and I die for Him. Would you die for the cause of Christ? If God so called you to be confronted with a situation where you'd have to give your life, you know with the the text that says the very hairs of your head are numbered, and, and if one's two sparrows, a soul for a copper coin, not one of them falls to the ground apart from the Father's will. Do you know the context of that statement? It's in Matthew 10, beginning with verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Are not two spares sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your Father's will? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered, Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Sometimes when we think of having that relationship with God, we want it to be heaven on earth, and it won't ever be. There are times when, and it's coming, it's here, that if I'm going to have that love for God, I've got to stand up for Him, brethren. I've got to speak for Him. I have to speak for what's right and do what's right. If I really have that relationship with Him that that He wants me to have, when when push comes to shove in the spiritual world, you stand up for the Lord. Speak for Him. That's when He's really your Father, isn't it? That's when He's really your God. That's really when the relationship comes to a strong conclusion. I believe. And those promises that He made. And I'll live my life here in such a way He has given. I'm a recipient. Now God says, now till you die, if you want these things, you live like you really want them. Thinking of this this morning, God is the greatest giver. One of the things that He's given is His Son. And He offers us the opportunity every time we come together to make things right with Him. You may need to do that this morning. You may may need to put Christ on in baptism for the remission of your sins. Whatever your need, the invitation is yours now as we stand in.